Hi everyone, my name is Paranaz Nasseri. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto and in collaboration with our colleagues from the Harriet Watt University and European Space Agency under supervision of Professor Sean Hom, I'm going to present the results of one of our projects on the inverse design of dual band and triple band reflective polarizing surfaces using a generative machine learning method. On the application of these multiband polarizers, we should look at the typical four color scheme, reuse scheme employed in multiple spot beam coverage by satellite communication. In this scheme, uh, four different beams are generated that are different in frequency and in polarization. The polarization of all these beams is, is in a circular polarization and each beam um, supports both downlink and uplink. Typically, or conventionally basically, in order to generate these beams, we would need four reflectors. But if we can design a specific um, linear to circular polarization converting reflector, then we can generate each pair of these beams that are different in uh, polarization using only one reflector. So, in order to do that, this reflecting polarizer that can do the polarization uh, conversion basically has to convert the horizontally aligned incident wave to LHCP, let's say, in downlink and the vertically aligned um, incident wave to RHCP at the same time. And then in the uplink, it should do the reverse thing, meaning that it should convert the vertically aligned incident wave to LHCP and um, the horizontally aligned incident wave to RHCP. If it can do this, then the one reflector can support generating uh, the two beams of A and B. And in order to generate the whole um, scheme, then instead of four reflectors, we would need only two reflectors. So that results in considerable amount of mass and profile reduction. So now that we know um, what kind of functionality we expect from this reflector here, um, then we can microscopically design its constituent elements. So these constituent elements are usually um, um, unit cells or scatterers that are asymmetric in the horizontally and vertically directions, and they can uh, treat the electromagnetic waves uh, that are aligned in L um, horizontally or vertically differently. And it is worth noting that these uh, unit cells would be backed by a ground plane, so they would work in complete reflection modes. So what do we need from this polarizing reflector? First of all, uh, we want the linear to circular polarization conversion, which means that in terms of the linearly polarized reflection coefficient, we want the the vertically aligned and horizontally aligned incoming waves to be completely reflected back. And meanwhile, we want to have a 90 degree, 270 degree phase difference between them, or in general, an odd uh, multiplication of pi over two. And then we can define axial ratio of the circularly polarized uh, reflected wave uh, using this formula. And as long as this axial ratio absolute value is between 1 and a square root of 2, which means maximum of 3 dB, then that, that's what we call a good linear to circular polarization um, conversion. Something else we need is the orthogonality of the reflected CP waves in the bands. So if the axial ratio in the downlink is between 1 and a square root of 2, we want the, um, the axial issue in the uplink to be between minus the square root of 2 and minus 1. And that way, we can um, guarantee that the two uh, CP waves are orthogonally um, related to each other. Or this can be reversed. It doesn't uh, make any difference for us. As long as the two are orthogonal, and then we're fine. Something else we need is that um, in, uh, for a space application where the reflector is spatially fed, um, for a typical value of f over d, which is the distance between the feed 
uh, F being the distance between the feet uh, and the reflector, and D being the dimension of the reflector, more than one, then uh, we do need um, the performance of this linear to circular polarizing reflector to be a stable um, for oblique incidence up to um, 30 degrees in both um, phi equal to zero and phi equal to 90 degree as well. And then preferably we want this structure to have a low profile. So a single layer of structure would be more desirable. So these um, structures are usually um, designed using conventional methods, methods that rely on researchers' experience. And then uh, typically the researcher optimizes a structure for normal incidence and kind of have to live with what they get for the oblique incidence performance. And then naturally this causes a limited exploration of the design space. And then at the end, uh, we, we end up with limited number of successful designs in the literature. But here we are proposing to use a machine learning method when a generator acts like an experienced researcher and explores the design space um, till we can find a better, a better candidate uh, for the application that we want. Now this pr proposed method, because it, it is relying on data-driven um, approaches, it can have uh, or offer a better understanding at, uh, of the features of good candidates or design. And then we can systematically uh, optimize the design from the beginning for an ang angularly stable performance. And then it can offer uh, a more thorough exploration of the full design space that can be very diverse. A machine learning generator uh, can be um, fit into two main categories. One of them is the decoder of a variation on autoencoder, where the encoder and decoder are trained um, together. And once the latent space or the feature space of these um, structures are learned, the decoder becomes a generator that can uh, create new structures. The other category is the generator of a generative adversarial network. When again, there are two networks, generator and discriminator, and the generator after training becomes um, a good researcher that can produce different structures. Now, Variational autoencoders are typically good at interpolating the features that it's learning from the training data and create uh, a sample that has um, features that are interpolated from the ones um, in the training data. But generative adversarial networks are more uh, stochastics uh, and then and the generation is more random so we can get um, di more diverse um, shapes generated. Because of uh, the random nature of the generative adversarial network, we chose this generative method to explore the design space for the problem at our hand. As we mentioned, a generative adversarial network is composed of two neural networks, the generator and the discriminator. The input to the discriminator is a training data and what is generated by the generator. The input to the generator is just a random noise vector. So in one cycle of the training, basically one random noise vector is fed to the generator, a shape is created, and the discriminator then needs to decide if this uh, shape that was created um, it, is it either um, produced by the generator or uh, is one of the ones from the training data? If it recognizes it from recognize it as one of the samples in the training data, it labels it as real. And then if it recognizes that it's one of the 
it's not a sample that belongs in the training data and it is generated by the generator, it's going to label it as fake. In this process, the generator learns how to come up um, with a design that is more uh, similar to the ones that are in the training data so that it can fold the discriminator to label it as real. But the discriminator becomes a better critic at distinguishing the dis differences between the training data samples and the ones created by the generator. So in this process, they are in constant uh, contest with each other, the generator trying to fool the discriminator and the discriminator trying to critique the generator better at learning the features of the training samples. So we did mention that uh, we do need the training data for the discriminator so that it can compare the samples generated by the generator uh, to, to them. So in order to uh, create this training data, we took a two-step curation method. The first one is that instead of using a pixelated representation for the scatterers, we went with um, a specific primitives or designs here that we know would provide a meaningful scattering parameters while they provide enough uh, or adequate degrees of freedom uh, to manipulate the horizontally and vertically uh, aligned incoming wave in the way that the polarizer that we want to design would. So we went with uh, Jerusalem cross, meander line in X direction and meander line in Y direction. And these would uh, provide enough inductance and capacitance for the functionality that we want. So 3,500 samples were generated uh, using this method and then they were simulated. But let's re remember that we want the generator to become um, a good researcher or an experienced researcher in designing good polarizer or dual band polarizer for us. So uh, in order for the generator to learn to do that, we need to provide samples to it um, samples to the generative adversarial network that have this functionality or basically have some somewhat this functionality hidden in them so that the generator can learn their features so in so that's why we took a second step where we filtered um the scatters among these 30 35 100 samples that weren't a good polarizer. To decide how much of a good polarizer a scatterer would represent, we define this loss function where we define basically maximum and minimum level of axial ratio in the two bands and then uh, we apply the, the sign of the axial ratio in order to keep the uh, CP uh, reflected wave orthogonal to each other. And then out of all of these 3,500 samples, we chose the ones that um, have uh, the loss function less than 5.5. And then these would be kind of like good polarizers for us and the generator should be learning their features. So these 2,400 samples with the 90 degree rotated scatters um, were chosen as a training data of the GAN. So now that the training data is ready, we can train the GAN. In each iteration of the training, a batch size of 256 samples is fed to the discriminator. Half of these samples are coming from the training data and they are labeled with YK being one, and the other half are created by the generator and they are labeled with zero. And basically 128 samples are created by the generator when it is fed 128 random noise vectors. And the discriminator needs to decide the probability off of, off of each 
uh, sample here. And then we can define a loss function as written here, where the discriminator basically has to um, predict the probability of each sample belonging to either the training data or being created by the generator correctly. And by minimizing this loss function at the end of the training, the discriminator is basically uh, predicting the probability of all samples to be real. And that means the training is done. That means that the generator is so good now that it can create samples that are so similar to the real scatterers or the scatterers in the training data that the discriminator is labeling them uh, or predicting the probability of them to be one. Then this loss function is back propagated to the discriminator and the generator so that the weights of these neural networks can be updated. Atom optimizer is used and the random noise dimension is chosen to be 50. This number is a trade-off between a small number and a very large number. If the noise dimension is too small, then uh, we are limiting the diversity of the scatterers that are being created. And if it is too large, then some of these features become zero and wouldn't affect anything except complicating the optimization that we are going to run later. So after training the GAN, uh, we can create diverse set of samples and scatterers by uh, feeding random noise vectors to the generator. And you can see these samples can be created where they, while they are very diverse in the shapes, they have some of the features that look like the Jerusalem cross or meander line that we saw in the training data. So once the generator is trained, we can use it in an optimization to create new candidates um, and um, potentially find the optimized polarizer that we want. So we integrate this generator in a particle swarm optimization in the 50 dimensional space. So uh, in, in this optimization, let's say a sample is chosen from the 50 dimensional space. It is fed to the generator and the generator creates an image of the scatter. Then using an in-house uh, image processing tool, we convert this image to a CAD file. And then this CAD file is uh, basically uh, converted to a scatter that is backed with a ground plane and it is on uh, placed on top of a dielectric um, substrate and then it is full wave simulated. Then an axial ratio error is quantified here. In order to systematically design for an angular st stable polarizer, the axial ratio error here is the average of the axial ratio error for normal incidence and the maximum oblique incidence of 30 degrees in both uh, phi equal to zero and phi equal to 90 degrees. Here, we also applied some um, shift in the frequency so that even if the axial ratio response is slightly shifted from the frequency that it response that we want, it, it would be still a um, uh, an acceptable design because then we can address that by scaling the scatter or a minor modification in the structure. So here first we wanted to design a, uh, a dual band reflective polarizer where the uh, CP waves would be orthogonal in the two bands. So first uh, we aimed for 10 uh, to 12 gigahertz for the lower band and 16.5 to 18 gigahertz in the upper band. And you can see that uh, the optimization method using the generator uh, came up with a new design that it's quite angularly stable for the uh, normal incidence and the oblique incidence that we wanted. And it achieved even more than what we asked uh, in the lower band and the higher band while maintaining the orthogonality of the CP waves here. 
So after the success we saw in the design of the dual band polarizer, we challenged the optimizer to come up with a triple band uh, polarizer. We ask for one gigahertz of bandwidth in each band and the orthogonality of the reflected CP waves in each uh, two adjacent bands here. And you can see that the result while look like a Jerusalem cross, it is different. And at the same time, we achieved more than the one gigahertz that we asked for. And then we maintain the angular stability and the orthogonality that we uh, wanted. In conclusion, the proposed generative machine learning uh, approach here can be employed to thoroughly explore the design space for the challenging problem uh, that we had our, at our hand. And then we were able to systematically um, include different high level constraints such as bandwidth, angular stability and polarization orthogonality. And we saw that the proposed method yields unique polarizer where there is a scarcity of similar examples in the literature. I would like to mention that the prototype fabrication and measurements are in progress. Thank you so much for watching this presentation.